Welcome! My name is Craig Carroll, President of Team One Plastics, and this is our first ever blog interview with an industry expert. I'm pleased to have with me Lori Harbor of Harbor Results. She's the President of Harbor Results, and we know each other from a long way back. She's an industry expert in the plastics field, manufacturing, and automotive arenas. Thank you, Craig. Thanks for having me here today. I'm pleased to be part of this blog exercise with you. Why don't we start? I really want to focus on sort of a plastic industry. As I mentioned, you have a lot of experience in plastics, and you work closely with plastics companies like Team One Plastics and people within the whole plastics industry as a whole. So can you sort of give us an update on where you see the industry today? Well, obviously there's a lot going on within not just plastics, but within manufacturing in general. We're seeing a little bit of the return of the economy overall, and as that occurs, you're seeing more manufacturing improvement. Within the plastic space, there's a tremendous amount of, of you know, return to steady kinds of growth. We're seeing a lot of companies that are getting stronger, they're running at higher percentages of utilization, and frankly, a lot of them are getting much more profitable in today's industry. Well, that's great news because, as we know, the last few years have been rough years, starting with 08 through 09. As you've seen changes, and I know you've seen major changes created by that recession, what would you sort of say would be some of the positive and negatives that have allowed companies to be positioned for some of the growth you talk about? Well, we started to see some of the companies that were that took advantage of the recession and made improvements within their business actually grow and not only become profitable but kind of separate themselves from some of the weaker companies whereas some of those companies who didn't focus their efforts on continuous improvement or what we like to call um, doing more with the same in other words they cut their resources back and they began to add more production volume and do it with fewer people and fewer resources which allowed them to make more money so we're seeing kind of a separation of the the, the best companies and the companies that are a little bit weaker and and some of those that are weaker are starting to learn that maybe some of that consolidation is going to have to happen for them. Well one of the things I remember during the whole recession is, is I heard many people talk about the consolidation that was going to happen and I think you would agree it didn't happen to the degree many right. people thought. Why do you think that happened? I mean, Well I think there was a couple things that happened. There was companies who in, in all along throughout their businesses, they probably knew how to do more with the same and knew how to be better, but didn't necessarily have anything that precipitated them to have to get better, mm -hmm. right? So in many cases, when people got into the recession, they kind of hunkered down, sort of battened down the hatches, and cut costs like they, they never had done before. So in doing that, they got better. The, the real challenge that companies are facing today is as they start to come out of that recession, are they going back to the wasteful ways of before, or are they doing things that are different and better than before? And that's where we're seeing this kind of bifurcation of those that made the improvements are getting better, those who didn't are throwing kind of waste back at it, or the old ways of business, and they're struggling. Hmm. So. As we look to the future, what do you see maybe challenges and threats over the next few years? Well, there's a couple key things that I think are significant. People are still trying to figure out where is their sales going to come from. Are we going to have the same sales people or the customers today that we will have in five years? Or are we going to need to look for new customers? Will the demand be the same? Will we return to levels of, of sort of a boom economy of the 90s? or will we get to a, a much more balanced approach? Um, operational challenges are still very significant for people and probably one of the most more, more um, you know, right kind of in front of them challenges is this people issue. We have an aging population in North America. We are, people are struggling to get good skilled labor and that frankly the good people are working and the other people that aren't working are not meeting the expectations of, of the good companies today. And that's a struggle we're having at Team One, similar to most people in the industry. What would you say one or two creative ideas that you've seen of how people are addressing that people shortage? Well, one of the things that we're seeing a lot of our customers doing, whether um, they're in manufacturing or engineering, is they're going and creating relationships 
not with universities only, but with local high school type of, mm. of uh, education sources. Community colleges, people who are, are not necessarily bound for the large corporate America job, but are, are, are ready to work kind of in the middle class and in the small to medium sized companies. So there's a lot of great kids in school today who will not graduate as we did and, and get into corporate America kinds of jobs because they just don't exist, right? So, so right now I think the best effort we're seeing is people digging into the, the high school age and helping kind of form people's thoughts about where they might go work in the future. Hmm. And as you look, um, the industry is changing. What do you see are would be the big growth areas or opportunities for people like Team One as a plastic molder? Well, I, I, being from Detroit, I am pretty keen on the automotive industry, mm -hmm. and I think the automotive industry is kind of a leading indicator to the rest of the economy. So, I believe we'll see growth in the in in the industry again. And I think as the really good companies and the weak companies begin to separate those who are the strong will gain some of that business away from the weak. So I think auto is, is a good space. Lots of people in plastics are looking at the medical industry. The problem with medical is it's a big leap. If you're an automotive supplier to become a medical supplier, there's no guarantee that that will happen successfully. I think consumer products and industrial will return. We're seeing a shift of manufacturing back to this country primarily because of wage rates increasing in low-cost countries. So, so I think when it, it comes to agricultural or the transportation business as a whole, I think it's a great opportunity for Team One and others because the automotive and the structure it requires is not something that everybody has. And when you do, you can build upon that and grow. Well, as you know, we're an automotive molder, so we agree. But it seems like so many people are fleeing from automotive because of the, you know, pressures that just exist in that industry and more are flying to the other industries which I think leaves opportunities as you say for That's people right. who can compete in that in that arena. That's right. You mentioned that actually you're seeing work coming back from the low cost countries. So that's a positive for manufacturing. Is that a trend that you see continuing? I, I do actually. We've spent a lot of time in China in the last couple months and there are companies in China who are talking to us about how much their labor rates have gone up just in a one year period of time and the expectation is something like a 10 to 15 percent wage increase over the next five years which is really about raising the skill level of of the of the blue collar worker for lack of a better word mm -hmm. right they have very high skilled labor in engineering and in management and leadership where they're struggling is within the skilled base so they're raising the, the, the pay level and they're bringing more people into that um, arena of manufacturing as opposed to shoving them all into engineering and four-year educations. Mm -hmm. So to do that, they have to raise, la excuse me, raise the wage rate. Um, the expectation is that by 2015, there may only be a 20 or 10 to 20 percent labor gap, which will, will be a prohibitor for people to run to China as they have in the past. It may become easier from a total land and cost perspective to build things here in the U.S. That's great news, being a U.S. molder. I know there was a big push over many years to get into more value added, in particular assembly or secondary operations in recent years. Do you think that's been successful for most plastic processors, and do you see that a formula for success in the future? I think that it's been mixed. I think that there's some companies who went sort of all the way to let's bring in as much value-added assembly as we can because if you remember, especially in auto, the, the goal of the tier one supplier was push away as much, bring in modules so that I have to assemble less, put all the work to you guys, and then be able to, to send it by customer. Um, that I think is starting to change a little bit because there hasn't been as much success at the tier two level. Mm. It's very challenging to do assembly and to do molding. You can be great at molding, and poor at assembly, you can be good at assembly and poor at molding. So there's a balance that has to be there. We've seen some companies go into value added because it's where they've been able to make up the profit they've lost on the molding. And others who have, have just not done it well. They haven't executed it well. So as you know, the plastics industry is really a fragmented industry. Lots of smaller companies like Team One Size 
and there's always been talk again of consolidation and mergers, and I know that's been on the back burner because of just the whole recession. Do you see that accelerating, and do you see ever a point where it becomes more consolidated? Um, you know, I guess I would say that it's very difficult to have a crystal ball as it relates to that. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, I think that small business, particularly in the U.S., is going to remain very strong. I think you will always see thousands of five to twenty million dollar companies. And if you look at the statistics, eighty percent of manufacturing companies are under mm -hmm. fifteen million in terms of revenue. So I think you'll see a lot of that stay. There will certainly be some consolidation as larger companies want to bring their tier two kind of into the fold of the process. But I think that you you will continue to see small companies flourish. The biggest challenge to that, frankly, is our economy and our government. If government continues to make it difficult for single owners like yourselves or, or you and a partner like yourselves to do business in from a government perspective, it, it's going to make being a small business much more difficult. They haven't really helped us much. The they last have few not years. helped you much at all. That's right. <laughs> They've added a lot of costs. That's that, right. That's difficult to compete in a global environment. And really, plastics is is really a global industry. Right. So to wrap up, um, we really appreciate all the insight you've given us on the plastics industry. So, can you give us one or two keys to success? You talked earlier about successful companies and and how they've sort of um, separated themselves from maybe the less successful companies. What do you see that there's one or two things that we would say, if you really want to be successful, you should focus on. The thing that we probably find the most in small to mid-sized companies that is lacking is this inability to plan and look at what does the future look like. Most small business owners would say to us, I'm small, I have my hands on everything, I don't really need to plan. But the reality is, is those companies who are making significant margins in a $20 million business are making them because they've planned appropriately for what kind of customer do I want to have, what does the makeup of that customer look like, what industries do I want to be in, and then ultimately, operationally, what are my plans and how do I communicate to my employees and how do I develop people. Mm -hmm. So planning is a very important thing. And I think the other thing we see the most opportunity for improvement or those companies who've succeeded are doing is they're driving the throughput in their organization. In other words, when they make that dollar of revenue, are they doing it more efficiently than they did the last time? And so many companies will tend to push output. In other words, I've got to just get production out the door and do that at any cost, throw people at it, you know, run awkward shifts run over time, whereas those who are really making money are driving throughput, they're measuring it and they're driving throughput and they're planning effectively. Hmm. Well, as I mentioned, I appreciate all the information that you've shared with us today. And Harbor Results has been a great partner with Team One and from a planning perspective, they've really helped us over the last year or two. So if you're interested, we'll have some information that you can contact Lori and we hope to get feedback on your interest on in this kind of format and was it useful? So thank you and we'll be back soon.